short experience, I felt that writing is first and foremost a confrontation with yourself, especially with your voice. The way you see the world and in what extent you're able to express what you see of that perception, right? Um, so it's mainly a confrontation with your soul, right? Whatever you're writing, whatever technique, even uh, if you're not writing about yourself, about your environment. So my first question to both of you is, what are the strategies and techniques you apply to first perceive and then translate everything you perceive to paper? What's the process of translation from what you see to what you say? Well, you talk about strategies and techniques, so I'm going to try to say something useful for you. I think everybody has their own recipe and kind of follows their own path. In my case, there's usually um, an image that comes up to me at some random moment of the day or night, and that's the beginning of the story. And then I kind of chase the story, you know, like um, I want to see the story play out. I need to know some major moments of the story. So I play it in my head. I, I try to come up with the sound or the atmosphere before I sit down uh, to write. Uh, I, d I don't want to be sitting down in, in front of my computer or, or notebook without anything previous. So basically my technique is in whatever fiction is, is near or Im image that comes I don't know where from where, uh, but there's a strong image. Try to follow it and kind of see where it goes. Did I receive the image of the ending or of the beginning? Um, I don't know. Uh, so for example, very briefly, one of my novels uh, is, my second novel was about a kidnapping in Guatemala City. And I remember that the first scene that I saw was uh, they exchange, the, the money exchange. So I didn't know if this was the beginning, the end, or the middle of the story, but I had to find out. And so that was the story. And in my first novel, it was about two people talking, uh, two people talking from very different perspectives. Didn't know if it was the beginning, the middle, or the end. And then I started writing once I figured out the story. So that's my strategy and technique that I hope you find it. So basically it's don't sit down to write unless you have thought about the story you're going to tell. How, how do you come up with this strategy? I mean, was it a thing of trial and error? Did someone teach you this at, any, at some point in your career? Or as you say, because it's a very personal thing, right? At the end of the day, how did you find it basically how do you how how do you make it your own thing in this years all right um i don't know if i own it or not i mean i remember uh we were a group of uh people that wanted to write uh, we we used to write a lot we used to read a lot we made a list of the best uh, novels that had come out of latin americans 20th century novels we read them we talked about them we made notes, uh, we tried to make essays about these novels, but basically we read and talked a lot. And that's kind of like what we, where it all began. We wanted to tell stories, we wanted to have reference of good stories that we have read. Um, and then I remember, you know, um, I wrote a 400 page novel that I would sit down and write. And when I had finished writing it, there was no story there was nothing. Uh, there was, uh, out of those 400 pages, there was one story that kind of stood out. And so I decided to throw all that away and keep that short story. And that was my first short story published. It was about seven pages, 10 pages. And then after that, I decided that I would never sit at the computer again and just write because <laughs> basically it was worthless. But I had to think about what I wanted to write about. And so I came up with it by trial and error and basically facing the fact that what had taken me eight or nine months to write was useless. 
but it was the first step towards finding something that I really wanted to say. Thank you, thank you so much. Mark, yourself, what would you say is your technique or strategy to be able to translate everything to paper or a screen for that matter? Everything I write is priceless. That's the difference between them. <laughs> Lucky you. Uh, just kidding. Um, you know, I'm writing a memoir, which is a very difficult thing to do, to look at yourself. Uh, Freud said that he could analyze every, everybody in the world. They could all come into his sofa, sit on his sofa, and he could figure out their story, but he couldn't analyze himself. He needed somebody else to do it for him. And I, I kind of feel with questions like that, they're so broad and they're so encompassing that it's difficult to pinpoint. But let me, let me say this. Um, getting an idea is not an intellectual experience. It's, it's an organic, personal experience. And I can't tell you when it starts. It's like when people ask me, what, what's your favorite book? that you've written. And I say, well, what's, what's your favorite child? You know, I, I, it's that kind of uh, question that's so hard to answer. Uh, when, does an, when do you get the actual moment where of creation? Well, it's, it's, like, a, it's like a romance. Um, you know, remember that snowy night when we got together, had a few drinks, and then you got pregnant? Yeah, I kind of remember that night, but not the exact moment. You don't know when the moment of life begins. So I, I can't tell you when I get an idea. I can only tell you when I have an idea, when the idea has already kind of invaded my emotional privacy. Um, with my first book, Death of a Rebel, uh, was, a, was a biography of my best friend. Looking at him, I could tell you everything. And if he, you talk to him about me, I'm sure he could tell you a lot of things that I wouldn't want him to tell you. But um, to write about myself, uh, it's really what you do with every project. There's an aspect of yourself in every project. I wrote, I wrote two or three novels uh, when I was younger, but I couldn't, um, I wasn't satisfied with that process. It was too amorphous for me. Uh, um, and that's a, that's a personal thing. With biography, you already have a beginning, middle, and an end. So the question is not what film did they make, or what was their next movie, or who did they marry, or the question is why did they do that? Where Where is the subject in his or her work. What on the screen or in their activism uh, is reflected in what moves me? So, I, I, you know, when, when, I, when I did uh, Cary Grant, which was a huge book for me, it was just published in, in uh, Spanish. We're going to leave a copy at the library, republished in Spanish. It keeps keeps coming back in different parts of the world. Um, one of the reasons I wrote the Cary Grant book is because he was my mother's favorite actor. And she used to rave about Cary Grant. I used to say to myself as a kid, wait a minute, aren't I as great as Cary Grant? Why, why is she not raving about me? That, yeah, funny, uh, it, I agree with you. Um, but it's not funny. You know, something there that I needed to find out. I needed to find out who this fellow was that my mother loved so much. And so the spark of creation, a as you say, you, you know, um, you actually do sit down, I think, and look at a blank screen. And a blank screen is your enemy, in a sense. It's a challenge. And you have to somehow find what's inside of you, get it out, put it on the screen, the computer screen I'm talking about, <laughs> And then a year, two years, five years, a hundred years later, somebody read it, and when they're finished, think that they know you, even if you're writing about somebody else. Now, we just saw a, a devastating movie in our 
second year class. And even though it was made um, all those years ago in a different culture, not only in countries, but in time and, and um, in emotions, we all got it. So William Wyler came alive for us today when we watched that film and how he put himself in it. Well, that's, you know, part of all the biographies are a part of my own existence. So I'm trying to take this leap into taking the shield away and, and try to show you a little bit of who I actually am. With a memoir, it's very, very difficult. I need Freud to help me if, he, if he's around, and he'll, then I'll be able to get it down. Um, so I find biography to be an art form, and the external um, uh, form, beginning, middle, end, is already there. And so the conflict is, is not between necessarily two characters, as you would have in a, a movie or a novel, but it's really between me and uh, the character to try to clarify that character through my writing and to clarify who I am through that character. So I hope that's yeah. some kind of an answer. Completely. For yeah, and I like, I'm very captivated for how it mirrors something that you have been uncompromising about during the, the class, uh, during the course, which is to have a personal take on film. Uh, you always come um, explaining your opinion, but uh, as in like explaining your own sensibilities and how they, they themselves are informed by what you have lived, I think. That's very important for the students. And um, I'm very grateful that you finally are speaking about yourself in this memoir. Uh, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> um, uh, you know, a, a film to me, is a way of sharing. It's, it's, it's giving something back. Uh, I know when I was uh, in uh, film school, I was inspired. Uh, I, it wasn't just learning. It was inspiration. It was uh, an emotional experience for me. And those people who inspired me, Herman Weinberg, Andrew Saris, the, the great Andrew Saris. These were people who put me on a path. You know, they set me off on that yellow brick road. And, and um, I've tried to follow it without being too distracted by the poppy fields and all of that in the film. Um, and it's not always easy. You know, you have real life to deal with, which sometimes annoyingly gets in the way of your work. Um, but those people, they're alive to me. They, they are living. Even if I want to think they're living a little bit through me, they're alive. And the people who have inspired me, who left a legacy in me, uh, hopefully I'm leaving that legacy to the next person in the class who uh, uh, hears something or feels something and starts his or her own journey. Um, yeah, so when I, when I talk about film in, in a class, I'm externalizing what I feel, but I, I also want to know what the students feel. Uh, so there's some kind of dialectic that I can get generationally, emotionally, um, um, uh, cinematically. You know, I always try to direct these courses so that we forget about literary convention. We talk about film convention. And that's, you know, when you see an accident, uh, let me just give you this one quick uh, example. Six people are walking down the street, and uh, one car hits another car. And uh, as you well know. And, and um, the police come, and they say, all right, what did you see? And you get six different versions of what just took place. Why? Because people don't know how to see. They don't understand what's in front of them. Uh, and therefore, they kind of fill in the blanks. And uh, oh, yeah, I, oh, that's right, it was a red car. Oh, was it a brown car? Studying film is the art of learning how to watch movies, to understand what you're seeing, why it's there, and how it affects you. 
So that's, that's really the same thing with writing. Uh, you've got to know who you are before you can talk about anybody else. And I spent a lifetime so far trying to uh, uh, not only understand myself, but reconcile myself with myself so I can then write about other people. Beautiful. Thank you, Mark. Um, Ronald, <laughs> your body of work addresses many cited topics such as or politics or history or culture yourself as a persona. Um, could you please discuss the importance of receiving feedback, of um, stretching your arms out of your bubble and reaching to hear a third party opinion? What's the importance of constructive criticism in your work? Oh, that's a very good question. One of the things I like when I listen to Mark is how much he cared about one of his mentors or professor, which was um, uh, Cyrus, Andrew Cyrus. And you know, he makes it a point that you know his name and he talks a lot about him. And one of the things that I found out when I was you know, trying to learn here, I was a young guy, really wanted to learn literature and uh, what, what did politics mean in Guatemala? Uh, why are we like we are? What had happened to our country, to my family, to ourselves? Uh, I really wanted to learn that. And where do you look for answers? You know, of course, you know, we could watch Hollywood movies, but they don't talk about Guatemala. You know, they've never filmed the street I was born in. Uh, so the songs rarely talk about our lives in this city or the culture that we come from. And so um, I was I started to look for people that could give me this feedback for what I wanted to do. And you're not going to find them unless you look for them. Uh, and I was very lucky to find some people. One of them, Osvaldo Salazar, who teaches now here in also, you know, when you see that, you know, he's older, but then you've also met some of the people that I trust and I talk to that give me positive feedback that have been my students or my friends, like Cesar Yuman or Juan Jose Solorzano. And so it's not about people that are way out there, you know, above you or older. It's also your generation. Uh, we, for a while, we had a very good uh, literary dialogue with Eduardo Halfon, for example or Francisco Alejandro Mendez, uh, who, you know, we engaged and talked to each other for, for a long time, you know, about what we were doing, what we were seeing, how we were experiencing the city, our lives, Guatemala, Latin America. What did it mean to be a Latin American writer where we're never mentioned, we're never mentioned? Uh, what did it mean to be a Guatemalan writer, much less mentioned than a Latin American writer? Uh, and if you're, you know, filmmaker, you know, what you talk to, call your friends for watching a movie is usually a U.S. movie, almost never a Latin American movie, almost never a Guatemalan movie. So we were very concerned about that. What we wanted, thing, we wanted to say a lot of things. Nobody wanted to listen to us. And nobody wanted to read us. No one wanted to watch us. Yet the things we were living were very important to us. So finding your crowd, finding your tribe, to share your fiction, your stories, your worries, your theories of what's going on in the world was very important. And for that, there was no age. Just people you wanted to share your stories with. And now, now that uh, literature, you know, that there's probably two or three bookshops in Guatemala, um, you know, there's very few bookshops, uh, very few people read us, very few people buy books. I know that I'm writing for a very few selected crowd, and that's even better because you know the people you're writing for. And what I'm surprised is when someone outside that circle reads you or sees your film, and they say, I empathize with your story, I loved your story, I hated your story because that is going to be a rare event to have someone engaged in your work so much that they want to tell you, I liked it or I hated it. So find your tribe, find your feedback, share with the group because you might have just found 
the most amazing people that are going to be in your life. So you got to realize that. This is your group. These are your friends. These are your, going to be your worst critics and your best readers or, or public. So trust them. This is a shared process. Um, a whole experience down here for me is um, a, a little bit of what you're talking about, I think. Because uh, I'm like, uh, as Robert Heinlein described, the stranger in a strange land. But, but I think all artists go through a period where everything is alien to you. That's kind of why you become an artist, um, to try to understand who you are, why you're here, anywhere. So when I was a, a, a kid growing up watching Hollywood movies from New York City, that was, uh, was also a stranger in a strange land. That world was so exotic, so far away, and yet I felt like I knew it. And uh, all, of that was, all of that stayed with me until I went to Hollywood and realized that uh, the wizard was behind that curtain and he was only a wizard. But in, it, it, I don't think it's, you know, Guatemala, I don't know that much about the film, commercial film, and here, but I think if you have something to say, where you're from is not a limitation. I mean, look at Alexander Solzhenitsyn, uh, what he went through to try to get a book written. He wrote it on toilet paper in, in a gulag, and it, it, it didn't come out until 30 years later in America when he finally, at the end of his life, had some measure of recognition. We are all strangers in a strange land. Uh, as T.S. Eliot said, you know, uh, we live until human voices wake us and we die. Yeah, we are walking around in an existential world that we need to find meaning in, or our own meaning. So, um, yeah, that's, that's the dilemma, is sometimes there's not a commercial outlet. Sometimes uh, Americans, don't know anything about Guatemala, in my opinion, uh, or Guatemalan film. But maybe someone like Emily will wake them up. Maybe Emily can bring something to America that they don't have. So being a pioneer, being an explorer, being uh, uh, someone who has something new to contribute, that's a positive thing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm as much a stranger in Manhattan as I am in Guatemala in many ways socially. I am. Um, very selective in my world. And so by choice, it's the same thing as uh, coming to a place like Guatemala or the Midwest where I curate for a museum, curate films. Um, uh, ultimately, it's, it's a personal battle, uh, a fight to have meaning in your life. And as artists, we try to share that self-discovery and try to make it universal, whether it's Guatemala, Hollywood, Berlin, Moscow, the moon, it doesn't matter uh, to me. Thank you. Uh, Mark, you are 27 books in, in a sprawling career. Um, I've been wondering, well, you know that I'm reading Napoleon's biography. You, you saw the book. Uh, the book started with a very incredible phrase. It said, every generation writes its own biographies. I'm wondering, with this sprawling career on your shoulders, what has been your experience in navigating the specific issues of every era, of every generation you, you have been part of in any way or another? Um, at the moment, when you sit down and write, uh, do you, how do you address those issues, or is it not necessary? Have you realized that it's better to stick to the universal, let's say, and not the specific cultural wars, wars lived in the day? That's a good question. I, re I really don't think about any of that. Um, you know, there are two, two main tracks on the railroad. Uh, one is sociological, one is creative. Um, the sociological aspects, it's like with film. You could talk about film in terms of its relevance, in terms of a film's relevance, or its historical nature, 
or its story, or its um, and where it was shot, or what it means to a certain uh, group of people. And you can talk about it creatively. Most critics write sociologically. Most critics, when you read them, they could be talking about a book, a play, music, a concert that they heard. Uh, most, most critics don't even have a basic understanding of what film is. So when I studied film, uh, especially with Andrew Saris, he was not a sociological critic. He was uh, a critic of style, of art, of individual expression. Um, but you know, it, it, you can't help with being sociological just by virtue of a subject that you're writing about. Uh, this fall, I'm going to be a part of a production in New York uh, about the Greenwich Village in the 60s. I mean, you can't be more sociological than that. And I happen to be a part of that world growing up when I was five. But I knew them all. You know, I knew Dylan Oaks, Eric Anderson, and most of them are going to be, who are still alive, are going to be there. So that's a sociological event among artists. The, the sociological importance comes from the audience who are interested in that world. But when I was living in Greenwich Village, going to coffee shops, having my friends pass the hat, playing with them, nobody thought about the sociological implications. Nobody said, we're doing something that uh, is sociologically important or politically important. They and I were trying to express ourselves. We happened to be in Greenwich Village. It could have been anywhere. It could have been right here. That group of people would have been um, creating. So when I talk to students about film, I try to steer away from sociology. Because ultimately, it's not a film subject. Ultimately, it, it's um, a literary evaluation of films. I try to talk about film in terms of personal style, personal attitude, what, what that film is about, and why we are watching it, and most of all, why we are moved by it. Which is very controversial these days, actually. Which is well, controversy is a good thing. Yeah, yeah. No. It, you know, we, as artists, we, we, our goal is to upset people. Otherwise, everybody's having a great time. Why create? Um, so, so my point is that when you're in the moment, when it's happening, you can't step out of the moment and say, ah, we are making an era that people will remember for 50 years. So uh, it'll be interesting to see this group. I haven't seen some of them in a while and to hear what they have to say about their own journeys. But I guarantee you that nobody will get up and say, I remember Greenwich Village because it became a, a center of folk music. Nobody will say that. They'll be talking about people. Their homes. Yeah. Their homes, but also their relationship to each other and, and how that brought out what they wanted to say or sing about. That's what they care about. Uh, the sociolo sociological aspects leave to the New York Times. So let them talk about it. You know, they, they surely know more than we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, so another question for both of you. Um, can you share perhaps insights into your revision process? Uh, it, it has become stereotypical now, a very much known cliche that writing is rewriting. Re um, what are uh, your late learnings about re revisiting a piece or, or, or sticking, or like what's your process with revision mainly? Okay, so <laughs> I think the writing is the easier part. You know, you're inspired, you're chasing an idea, a character. It's a beautiful moment where you fall in love with uh, your story. And it has to be like that. You, The story does not exist before you write it. It's never there. It, it appeared to you, you chase it, you catch it. And I always find it very similar to The Old Man and the Sea. And that's one of my favorite books of all times because the image that you have in your head is always going to be prettier than your work. 
And so it happens the same with film. When you envision your first uh, short, you thought it was going to be great. You know, watch out Tarantino and, and Nolan, you know, you're going to be better. And then once you shoot it, you find yourself that, oh, my God, I really came short. I don't want to show it to anybody. Uh, so that's the same thing what happens when you have your first draft. And what's really the work, the discipline, something called the craft, which I like, the craft, the word, the word craft, is the revision. What's the structure? What story are you telling? Um, and one of the things that people have forgotten, what is your style in the writing? It's, you know, uh, the standard uh, uh, phrase is uh, noun, um, the subject, the verb, and the, and the predicate. Um, but what words are you using? You know, why are you limiting yourself to a very uh, limited uh, lexicon or, or vocabulary? Can you use other words? Can you use less words? Can you say more with less, or you have to use more? All of that work is very important, and people want to get the book published, but don't want to do the rewrites. I used to have a number for every draft that I did, and uh, I did uh, probably 25 drafts that I printed and corrected of one of my shortest novels that has the most praise. Um, and one time, uh, a writer that I admired that it was very was older than me and still has a lot of success international, I gave him my book. He came back to me and he said, this book is perfect. And I said, oh my god, thank you. Would you write this? Would you write an, a book review that says this, that is he said, the, word you, the way you use sentences is perfect. I learned a lot reading you, and I admire this work. And I said, please write this. I admire you. Please write this. And he said, I'm never going to praise you in public. <laughs> and I was like, oh, my God, you know, I, I had admired you so much. Please help me. And he said, no. Uh, and after that book and the 25 drafts that I printed and made, um, I never kept count anymore. It was just until I was, OK, this is done. Let's get it out. And um, that was that. I thought I had cared too much for the work I did, and I needed to get it out. So the discipline for me was the key. Um, and that was that. That's something people don't want. They want to write. You know, In one sitting, you have a vision. You write obsessively. You finish it. You want to print it or shoot it and be successful. In that short novel that I told you about, it has been read and it has been long forgotten. And uh, I'm happy to say that. You know, Some people find it. I still get emails from saying, oh my god, where can I buy this book that I read at a library? It's excellent. And I say, it's out of print. I no longer care for it. Uh, you know, that's something I do, but I, I reprint. I should put it out in print. Uh, but that's, you know, so re the rewrite, the discipline, you want to have it, yes or no. Coming back and coming back and coming back. insisting. Yeah, I, I, you know, for one of the novels that, you know, that uh, is very, I'm very lucky that it got into the public system. And people read it because it's um, after, this is almost 30 years after the peace or accords were signed. Um, sociological people think this is the only novel that really captures what was going on during the peace agreements. And so they read it in school because of that, sociological reasons. And I wish it was literary reasons, but it's sociological reasons. But they read it, people like it, and it's still alive because of sociological reasons. But the questions I get asked the most in schools or by critics or by uh, by pundits is, what's up with the ending? Why is the ending so controversial? And I, uh, you said, oh, what do you think about the ending? I, I don't care about the ending. What do you think? And they tell me their versions. And I remember uh, writing three different endings for the story and sharing the endings with my four or five reading friends. And they didn't like the two endings that were discarded. 
they thought this controversial ending was the best. And so did I. But I needed that feedback. Uh, so there was a lot of work put into a simple novel at the time. I wrote it when I was 24. Uh, got the prize, what, uh, Central America, the biggest prize for novel when I was 25. Um, I wrote so much after that, things that I consider better. But always people praise me about that ending and that book. And I'm happy because people still read it. But for literary reasons, I hope they would read other of my work. But, you know, people are free to choose. They always choose that book. I'm okay with that. So the discipline, there's a lot of work put into that people will never find out. Thank you, thank you. Mark, any insights? I, when I was a kid, I saw a film called uh, Bell, Book, and Candle. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Uh, Kim Novak, Jimmy Stewart, and Ernie Kovacs, who was a uh, very famous comic who died in a car accident in uh, 1960. So you probably don't, uh, never heard of him. He plays a writer in the film. And I remember as a kid uh, wanting to be a writer, er Ernie Kovac, Kovacs walks around his office and there's a beautiful secretary there. And he's saying, and then the next day, and he's dictating this, this novel to this girl who's writing everything down. And that's, I thought, wow, what a great way to write, you know? Get yourself a beautiful secretary and walk around the room and uh, dictate whatever you think, and that's writing. Of course, it's a little different than that. Um, I love rewriting. Uh, rewriting to me is where the art comes in. Um, uh, writing, uh, think of sculpting, where you take a lump of clay and you throw it on a, on a palette, and there's nothing there. And, uh, and then you start to shape it. And what sculptors do is they continue to shape it until it's where they want it. They're not satisfied with an approximation. They want it exactly right. To me, the process of writing goes like this, and some of you may have heard this before, or we may have talked about it before. Um, I sleep with pencil and paper next to me. <laughs> Maybe you know, other people, but pencil and paper for sure. Um, also part of the creative process, but that's another <laughs> that's the later tonight, Rod. Very important one, too. Very important. Crucial. Um, but sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm a, I'm a night guy. I, I love, uh, if I can stay up all night, I'm the happiest guy in the world. 3 o'clock in the morning, I could be watching a movie, and suddenly something I wrote that afternoon comes together, clicks. That's what I wanted to say. That's how I wanted to say it, and, and that's, this is the way to do it. And I write it down, crazy as that may sound. Write it down, because if you don't, you, chances are you're not going to remember it anyway. I write it down. The next day, I spend the first half of the day rewriting what I wrote the previous day, because I now have figured it out to that point where I have to go back and fix it. And the other thing is that in the morning, you're still dealing with the dreams of the night before. So it's very hard to move forward when you're still reconciling what your subconscious has told you, which is where that 3 o'clock in the morning revelation comes from. Your brain figures it out for you. And um, then after I do that rewriting, to a certain degree of satisfaction. In the afternoon, I try to move ahead, try to write new material, further the story, um, continue the drama, the journey. Three o'clock in the morning, wait a minute. <laughs> this is what I wanted to say. And so the next day, I go back, fix that sculptor, fix that clay, until it's at a point where I can move forward. So it's, uh, you know, that Bruce Springsteen song, two steps up, one step back, or one step up, two steps, whatever it is. 
um, that's how that's how I write, and I find that the action, uh, the, the the heat, comes from the rewrite, because you are now in control of what your thoughts are. You now have the tools, hopefully, to be able to make that piece of clay into a masterpiece. Um, you know, everybody gets the same lump of clay when you, you're a sculptor. Here's a lump, here's a lump. It's up to you to turn that into your masterpiece. And the process, for me, is in the rewriting. And, you know, writing is so, it's so, such a crazy way to work. Then you, then you give birth, metaphorically, uh, to your finish. You put the final dot. And you say, all right, it's my masterpiece. I've written it. Then you send it to your editor, and he unmasterpieces it for you. <laughs> you say, wait a minute, what's, what's, what's happening? What happened to this guy? Where was that? Or why would he do this? And then you have another battle. Who's right, him or me? Uh, who's writing this thing? And so you go through that war. And uh, you finally get all of that reconciled. Then it goes to um, the publisher. Then they, someone designs a cover which has nothing to do with what you think the book is about. Uh, so, well, wait a minute, did you read this book? Or uh, That's one of the reasons why I, I love the Cary Grant cover. Not this one, but the original book had only the picture. Not my name, not Cary Grant's name. I thought, perfect. perfect. Um, so then you have to go through that battle. In, in my Merle Haggard book, that was not the cover I wanted. I wanted a different cover, but you can't win every battle. Don't open too many fronts. Uh, because you, you won't win. Let's think about World War II. Don't open too many fronts. Um, finally, a year or two after you have put that final dot in, the book comes out. And you are already somewhere else. You're in a, another project. Your, your, your mind has gone to another stop on the express train of your life. Um, and you have to then go back and revisit that time to, to generate the excitement of the moment that you had two years ago, three years ago. Uh, you know, when you watch things like entertainment TV programs, a film opens up, and there's the star of the film, and they say, oh, how's it going? Oh, it's going great, it's a wonderful film. That was done two years ago. Uh, that was done when they were making the film, and they, they store it until the right time to play it. But when you're a writer, you have to go out there and talk about things that you have already gotten out of your system. You've already expelled it from uh, the prison of your imagination. But that's the process. You, you are constantly revising, revisiting. That's why I can watch a film a you know, hundred times, because in a sense, I'm rewriting my interpretation of that film. Uh, when we watched uh, the film today, uh, you know, to me it's a brand new film. You see things that you never saw before. And that's the creative process with your own work. You know, sometimes it's, very, uh, on a, it's a very brave thing to do. I'll pick up a book I wrote 10 years ago and start reading it. You know, oh, my God. <laughs> Who wrote this? <laughs> this is the worst thing because you're not there anymore. You know, you become... Uh, in a sense, alienated from your own work. And that's part of the process of growing as an artist. I look back at my first child, Death of a Rebel, my first book, and I, you know, I love that book uncritically because it uh, changed my life and it, it, it uh, brought me back to a time and a place uh, when I wrote it, when I was uh, kind of on fire as a wild kid uh, when I wrote that book, not knowing what I was doing. But that actually was part of the good process of not knowing what I was doing, finding it, learning it as I went along. And I still get that. I st when I wrote the, the last book that I finished, uh, the Merle Haggard book, I was so impassioned that Stephanie and Ronald will tell you I was unbearable when I was down here, when I was writing that book. I, uh, right, I mean, I was just, I was singing Merle Haggard songs 24 hours a day because I was in the process. And you know, the people closest to you, they have to deal with that, and not, not a lot of people can. Um, that's why I marry a pad and pencil. 
because they will always be there for you three o'clock in the morning. That's my that's the best advice I can ever give you. But that's my that's my process. Thank you so much to both of you. You have shared a torrent of richness. <laughs> Thank you so much and see you later.